Hello, everyone, and welcome to season two of Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all as your moderator this evening as we go on a Spanish adventure along with Rick and a very special guest. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our tour guide for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Thank you, Gabe, and it's great to be back. I hope you had a good little summer break and it is time for season two of Monday Night Travel. And as I've been saying right from the start, I just need this time once a week, Monday night, where we get together and share our love of travel. We just enthuse about getting out there and embracing other cultures and having those travel adventures. It's my chance for me to just sort of virtually welcome you into my living room. I just love that idea that I open the door every Monday night and a couple of thousand travelers tumble in here. I hope you're comfortable. I hope you can make yourself right at home. I hope you've got your favorite travel partner with you, some good culturally appropriate food and drink. And are you ready to travel? Because I am. In fact, I'm kind of excited because I just got back from Paris. I was in Paris three days ago and I'm a little jet laggy, but it's good to be home. And I wanted to get out there and see what it was like traveling these days in Europe. And um, I did a six day hike around Mount Blanc with some great friends and it was 60 miles in six days. And it was the hike of my life. And then we went to Paris and just blitzed the city and it was just great to get back to Europe. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a future episode. Also, I wanna remind you a week from tonight, we've got a special episode, which is the hippie trail from Istanbul to Kathmandu across Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. I'm going to be joined by my original travel partner, Gene Openshaw. And considering all of the tumultuous news and, and, and frankly, the sad news coming out of uh, Afghanistan in the last month, I've been thinking a lot about my experience there back when I was a backpacker. And I've got some beautiful slides, and we're going to share that experience with you next Monday. But today, it's all about the greatest hits of Spain. And uh, we're going to go, well, let me introduce to you the, our, our Classroom Europe program, because that's where so many of these clips originate. And uh, if you just remember, you can always go to ricksteves.com. And at ricksteves.com on the homepage, you can find something called Classroom Europe. And if you click there, you find 500 different clips. And for me, this is so much fun because when we go to Classroom Europe, that's where we can um, explore all of these different clips. We've got, um, we've got uh, a chance to actually go to different people's playlists. And this is an archive of playlists. And uh, we've made playlists over the, over the last uh, few months. And if you type in the text search Monday, for example, because that's Monday night travel, you can find that there are about, well, 26 different roughly half hour playlists. And what we're going to do today is go to Monday Night Travel Spain Favorites with Federico Garcia Barroso. But I wanted to illustrate this with you because this shows you what teachers and homeschooling parents and travelers can do by lacing together these video clips. Today, we're going to see Salamanca, Barcelona, Toledo, Sevilla, bullfighting culture, and Columbus. And um, what we've got here is an example of how these playlists can help teachers in the classroom take their students on virtual trips. You've got the actual playlist, and then we've got questions. We've got discussion points. We've got projects you could do and more information. I'm so thankful to be able to share Monday, to share our Classroom Europe program with teachers all over our country, especially now that school is back in and people are interested in reaching out and better understanding our world. Hey, today, speaking of understanding our world, we're going to Spain. And the great thing about going to Spain is the people. And we've got with us a special guest from Madrid, who's up in the wee hours this morning to be with us live, Federico Garcia Barroso. Hey, Federico, thanks for joining us. Hola, amigos de América y Canadá. Thank you. Thank you for being there, my friends. I'm really happy to meet you today. And uh, we've been with Federico for 
more than almost 20 years, Federico has been guiding tours with us. And it's just so great to have you on our staff, Federico. And today we're going to be heading off for Spain. We're going to go to Barcelona, Madrid, Toledo, Sevilla, but you got to have food to do that. And I'm happy to have you because you've taken me to many bars for tapas in Spain over the years. And I've learned a lot from you. And I want to show off what I've cooked up today with the help of a local restaurant to give me all of my uh, dishes almost ready to go. But look at that. And this uh -huh. is a beautiful spread of tapas. And if we start on one side, we've got our patatas bravas. And then we've got our, ooh, our pimiento de padrón. And then we've got our gazpacho. And we're gonna get into all of the details on that a little later. We're gonna talk about my pan o tamat, my tomato bread. Spaniards love to crush a nice tomato on some nice toast, sprinkle some salt on it, drench it in olive oil and call that a meal. And also we've got our drink. I'm drinking cider from the north of Spain. Federico, what are you eating and drinking today, Federico? I'm just having here first a little bit of Rioja wine. Rioja okay. from, from the Rioja Valley, which is one of the best, one of the best red wines in Spain. What else? Hey, gazpacho. I also have my gazpacho. <laughs> Gluten free gazpacho from southern Spain, from Andalusia. <laughs> then, what about those Spanish olives? These skewers with uh, with um, um, olives, pickled peppers, and red peppers. You see the mm. bandejas from Spain. And of course, a little bit of uh, jamón ibérico, Iberian ham, and manchego cheese from the land of Don Quixote. All right. oh. Come on and manchego, I love it with your beautiful wine. Hey, we're going to talk more about the food later, but Federico, let's get right into our travels. We're going yeah. to Salamanca. And when we think about university towns all over Europe, I mean, you go to England, you can go to Oxford and Cambridge, go to Portugal, you can go to Coimbra. When you go to Spain, the venerable, classic, historic university town is one hour to the west of Madrid, and that would be Salamanca. Tell us just a bit about your impression of Salamanca. Salamanca, I can then tell you, Rick, how in Spanish language we have a proverb that says, when you find a person that is actually quite ignorant, a person that, that thinks and knows everything and knows nothing, you say, hey, you know what? If you want to learn, you better go to Salamanca. We say that in Spanish. Oh, uh, great. You better go to Salamanca. Some of the best high thinking people in Spain were there. Salamanca is a, it's a, it's an epicenter of culture. Salamanca is unique. And Salamanca is one of the best destinations for American students to improve Spanish language. And I think it's underrated. A lot of people don't think of going Salamanca, but it's got a great square. It's got a great Paseo theme. It's not that touristy. It's got a student vitality. And it's just, what, an hour away from Madrid by an easy train connection. It is a wonderful destination. I'm quite unknown. Right? All right. Hey, well, Federico, thank you for joining us. And I, I understand it's, what time is it in Madrid right now? Right now it's a quarter past 4 a.m. <laughs> quarter past four. And look at you. Well, let's have another drink to late nights in Madrid on Monday night travel. <laughs> Cheers. Salud. Salud. All right. Let's go to Salamanca. Thank you again for joining us on Monday night travel. And now we're going to learn a little bit about Spain starting in the university town of Salamanca. A highlight of any visit to Salamanca is its famous university. The oldest in Spain, it was established in the early 1200s and was one of Europe's leading centers of learning for 400 years. Today, while no longer so prestigious, it's laden with history and especially popular with American students for its excellent summer program. The university's ornately decorated grand entrance is another example of Spain's fancy plateresque style. The people studying the facade aren't art fans. They're trying to find a tiny frog on a skull that students look to for good luck. Okay, up the column, take a left, find the skull, the frog's on top. So the frog is right there carved onto the top of that skull in the middle of your screen. I spent a long time on my first visit to Salamanca trying to find that thing. And then I felt like, why did I bother? <laughs> now forget him. Let's follow the facade's symbolic meaning. The bottom part thanks King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel for the money to make the building. The middle section celebrates Charles V with the coat of arms of his Habsburg Empire, the world's only superpower in the early 1500s. 
Hey, Federico, this is amazing to me that uh, 500 years ago, in the early 1500s, Spain was the most powerful country in all of the West, in all of Europe. And Charles V was the most powerful man, arguably, in the whole world. Totally. He's actually the emperor. Emperor means king of kings. Ah. Charles, the first of Spain, Charles V of Germany, is the same person. I mean, and his uh, empire was so huge that we still say nowadays in the Spanish language, hey, in the lands of Charles, sun never set. So the English thought that was the empire upon which the sun never set. But long before the English had the empire upon which the sun never set, the Spaniards claimed it. Finally, as a statement of the school's open-mindedness, the top honors the Pope while putting him in the company of pagan gods. This venerable arcade leads to lecture halls where Spain's brightest minds grappled with issues raised by the dawning of a new age. Imagine Golden Age heroes paging through these books and pondering these globes. Cortez came here for travel tips. The narrow wooden tables and benches, whittled down by centuries of studious doodling, are originals. Professors spoke boldly from the pulpit. It was here that the free-thinking monk Luis de Leon taught in the 1500s. He challenged the church's control of the word of God by translating part of the Bible from Latin into the people's language of Castilian. Because of this, he was tossed into jail for five years. When it's so interesting, by the way, to think that 500 years ago, all over Europe, professors in, in, in religious universities were passionate about teaching the word of God, and they were frustrated by the fact that it was only available in Latin. And they risked their lives, they gave their lives to try to get the word of God into the people's hands in a language they could read. Jan Hus for the Czech people, he was burned at the stake. Martin Luther for the German speaking people, he translated the Bible into Germany and it created a huge war. A third of all people in Germany died after the religious wars. And I didn't know that until I went to Salamanca, but in the same generation, a great and courageous professor in Spain was risking everything, going to prison, by translating the Bible into the people's language so they could have it directly, rather than being spoon-fed to them by some Catholic priest that wanted to keep it in Latin so they could interpret it instead of the people. Finally released, he returned to this pulpit and began his first lecture with, as we were saying. Courageous men of truth, like Luis de Leon, believed the forces of the Inquisition were not even worth acknowledging. Traditionally, Salamanca's struggling students earned money to fund their education by singing in the streets. This centuries-old troubadour tradition survives today as musical combos called tuna bands, dressed in distinctive outfits, play lutes, guitars, and sing. For a fee, they serenade fancy family gatherings. And, celebrating with a beer after their gig's done, they can't resist brightening a bride-to-be's bachelorette party. And this fun-loving tuna band, the oldest in Salamanca, gave us a memorable trip finale back on the Plaza Mayor. Whoa, Federico, those tuna bands are amazing, <laughs> amazing. And Salamanca is the best place for them. Are we likely to see a tuna band when we visit Salamanca? Yeah, absolutely, by far, it's the best place. It's the best place. I, I think it's, it's really a wonderful experience to go there and find those students that are really motivated. They just, they just want to share that moment with you and have fun and, and, and sing and dance. And that is beautiful, really, really beautiful. It's a wonderful experience to see all those young men you see singing and dancing. And it's just wonderful. I love it. By the way, Federico, one of my memories of Salamanca is what I think is the greatest Plaza Mayor in all of Spain. It's an amazing main square. Almost every city has a Plaza Mayor main square. And this one, it gathers all the people every evening for the paseo. It's all the generations. And if I remember correctly, the boys are going in clockwise and the girls are going counterclockwise. So everybody gets to check everybody out. 
Everybody's there. Even the old ladies who just can't do the walk anymore, they're up looking down from their windows, just really disgusted at how trashy the girls are uh, dressing this year. And it was just, everybody was out and it just, I felt like I was part of the community. What, it's that magic, isn't it? Absolutely. It's actually the social epicenter of, of Salamanca, the main square of Plaza Mayor. It's, it's really, really nice. It's really beautiful to see that. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to go from Salamanca back to Madrid, and then we're going to catch the speedy train, the Ave, for about, what, two or three hours. Boom, we're going to get to Barcelona. And Barcelona, as we're going to learn, is a region of Spain with its own pride, its own language, and its own issues with Madrid. They want a little more autonomy. And boy, when you go to Barcelona, you're going to see them waving their flag and speaking their language with gusto, especially because they don't have to deal with Franco in the old days anymore. Barcelona has a rich history. Roman colony, Dark Age Visigothic capital, 14th century maritime power. And beyond all its great sights, be sure to appreciate its elegant sense of style and its Mediterranean knack for good living. The city's main square, Plaza Catalunya, is the center of the world for seven million Catalan people. It's a lively people scene throughout the day. The square is decorated with statues honoring important Catalans. Catalunya has its own distinct language, history, and flag, which locals fly proudly next to Spain's flags on government buildings and all alone from their apartments. Catalonia has often been at odds with the central Spanish government in Madrid. During the 1930s, this area is one of the last pockets of resistance against the fascist dictator Francisco Franco. When he finally took power, he punished the region with four decades of repression. During this period, the people were forbidden to fly the Catalonian flag. Instead, to show their national spirit, they flew this, the flag of the Barcelona soccer team. Catalans consider themselves not part of a region, that's what Spain calls them, but a nation without a state. Visca Catalunya! The Cat Visca Catalunya. It's like Viva de España, but for the Catalan people in Catalan language, Visca Catalunya. Catalan language is irrevocably tied to the spirit and history of the Catalan people. Sure, everyone speaks Spanish, but these kids speak Catalan first. Hey, Federico, a couple of years ago, when I was last in Barcelona and the region of Catalan, um, there was some very difficult problems between the secessionists, the people in Catalan that wanted to literally break away from Spain and have an independent country, and the people of the rest of Spain and Madrid. In fact, the government of Catalan, I think, was in risk of being arrested and put in prison by the, the, the Spaniards. What's the what's your take on that? How are the affairs now between Madrid and Catalan? Now the situation is getting better. I really think that it's more about politics rather than people. You see, I am as a, I am a Castilian man, and I always felt comfortable in, in Catalonia. And some of my Catalan friends, when they come to Castile, they feel also welcome. It's more about politics rather than than people. The situation is getting better and better. In, in, Many, many ways. You know, I was impressed by the difficult situation people had in Catalan because they're proud Catalonians, but that does not mean they're anti-Spain. And a lot of them wanted to be true to Catalan, but not break away from Spain. But they were given an extreme position. Either you're with Madrid or you're with the secessionists, and they wanted some middle ground. And in a lot of cases, that's the, the way it is. When, when the Scot Scottish people are given a choice to vote, it's all the way out or all the way in, but there's sort of a middle ground, isn't there? Exactly, it's, a, it's actually a very similar, very similar situation. There is a kind of a social problem in Catalonia because half of the Catalans, they just are still happy being Spaniards and half of the Catalans, they wanna be independent. So. And it is a kind of, a, there is always, there have to be a common denominator, you see, between both, which is absolutely. And you, you know, Federico, the thing I really appreciate is the European Union stands by the little countries, uh, the, 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 the um, what do you call it, the, the nations without states. Yeah. When, I, when I talk to the people of Catalonia, they say, oh, this is the region of Catalan. No, they say, we are a nation without a state, you see. And in, Bar in, in Brussels, they recognize that there's a lot of ethnic regions that have their own language that didn't get a country when they drew the lines, and they should have some autonomy. Uh, of course, in the old days, you could not speak the Catalan language. Today, people in Catalonia speak 
Catalan first and Castilian Spanish second, and that's okay. And that's a beautiful thing. Barcelona's ever popular strolling boulevard is the Ramblas. While souvenir shops and crowds of tourists have diluted its former elegance, it still offers an entertaining introduction to the city. The Ramblas bird market is a hit with kids. Traditionally, children bring their parents here to buy pets. Apartment dwellers find birds, fish, and bunnies easier to handle than dogs and cats. And I, I, I shot this clip, or we shot this clip, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, probably. And since then, Airbnb has come along. And Airbnb has let landlords realize they can make more money in one week renting to internationals than they can by one month to some grandmother or some retired company uh, family. And uh, consequently, there's no people that are living around the Ramblas except for other tourists. The people that used to live there, they give it all the character, have been pushed to the more affordable suburbs. And the bird market we just showed you is now no longer there. Federico, do you feel like um, Airbnb has contributed to the death of the Ramblas? Yeah, it's actually, it's a little bit controversial because it is true that nowadays the Ramblas and, and the Bocadilla market is more tourist. That is, that is a fact, okay? But at the same time, you see, Barcelona is actually quite happy to welcome travelers from all over every year, you see. And those things didn't happen before 1992 at the Olympics. So where is the limit? Where is that kind of, you know, medium point where people can actually yeah. enjoy the city with a local atmosphere and not so many, 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 many tourists? We are working on that. Yeah. Yeah. And all over Europe, Federico, there are characteristic zones that used to be vibrant with traditional local people that made those zones characteristic. And now those people have been driven out by the higher rents because of Airbnb. It's an interesting ethical issue. I don't know what, what the right answer is, but it's something we should be mindful of in our travels. <laughs> La Bocaria, just steps off the busy boulevard, is Barcelona's lively fish and produce market. Locals shop in the morning for the best and freshest selection. They say, if you can't find it at the Bocaria, it's not worth eating. Wherever I travel, I enjoy the cafes and little eateries in the markets. Here at the Pinocchio Bar, even while he and his family are busy feeding shoppers, flamboyant Juan is happy to flash his trademark smile. Ah, I love Juan. He's probably still there. Is he still there, Federico? Still there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's always like this. I got a picture of him doing that in my book. Hey, um, when we think of the, the rising tourism in this area, La Bocaria is a great, one of the great markets of Europe. You got to go there. But the reality is it's, it's not what it used to be because it's so touristy. But there are lots of equally good markets elsewhere. If you want to find what the Bocaria used to be, what's a market you might recommend? It's actually located not far from Bocaria, just 10 minutes walking. No more than 10 minutes walking distance. And then you find the Santa Catarina market, which okay. is one of the best ones not only by the way the building is so beautiful with those color tiles in the roof of the building then you go inside and you find local local food local atmosphere and we have to admit that Bocadilla is a little bit touristy and Santa Catarina is not so in English that's St. Catherine's St. Catherine's market and it's just about you can almost see it when you stand in front of the cathedral in the old center in the gothic quarter you look to your left and you can see the the street that goes there and you've got those beautiful wavy eaves don't miss uh the uh santa catarina market that is for sure back on the ramblas the carnival of barcelona life continues a variety of street entertainers vie creatively for your attention and your coins The bottom of the Ramblas is marked by the Columbus Monument. It was here in Barcelona that the Spanish King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel welcomed Columbus home after his first trip to America. 
It's ironic that Barcelona would honor the man whose discoveries opened up new trade routes that actually shifted the focus of European trade away from here on the Mediterranean and out to the Atlantic. And in doing so, actually contributed to the downfall of this city as a great trading power. But thriving Barcelona has clearly recovered. Just beyond the Columbus Monument, a modern wave-like extension of the boulevard called the Rambla del Mar stretches into the harbor. It leads to a popular mall of shops and eateries. A generation ago, Barcelona's waterfront was an industrial wasteland. With impetus provided by the 1992 Olympics, it's been completely transformed. The former Olympic Village, which now houses locals rather than athletes, is marked by Frank Gehry's eye-catching fish. The man-made beaches, a series of crescents that stretch for miles, are a huge hit. Each comes with lively cafes and bars, and all are laced together by inviting promenades, much appreciated by strollers, joggers, and bikers. Boy, I remember when that was an industrial wasteland. Nobody went there. There were no beaches. It was depressing. And this is a good example of how all across Europe, cities are investing in their old rundown quarters and turning them to really people-friendly zones with great boulevards. And Federico, this is a, a like a just this gen for the first time in a, ever. This generation enjoys a whole new dimension of Barcelona. Absolutely, Barcelona was a kind of. Uh unknown city before 1992 or something before before the olympics and then after that barcelona was in the map and now you go there and you see those clean i mean the barcelona was not actually facing the sea it was a kind of industrial city just yeah. uh, and now it's just you find those beautiful beaches of barcelona uh, that is that is wonderful barcelona and barceloneta and do remember in all of europe i think there's two or three cruise terminuses uh what uh Rome, Athens, and Barcelona. And if you're going to start a Mediterranean cruise or end a Mediterranean cruise, there's a good chance it's going to start or end in Barcelona. And your cruise does not give you time in Barcelona. So book yourself a few days before or after the cruise so that you can enjoy this great city. And it is a beautiful uh, departure point for people cruising the Mediterranean. Surprisingly nearby is Barcelona's gritty old center, the Gothic Quarter. It's a tangled yet inviting grab bag of charming squares, rowdy schoolyards, rich cultural treasures, and other surprises. Hey, Federico, a question for you. The Gothic Quarter is the tangled characteristic beautiful old historic center of Barcelona, so friendly for pedestrians, so filled with great shops and restaurants and museums and the great cathedral. Uh, I understand that a few years ago, the city was going to stop the rent control, and that would open up landlords to make up for lost time and understandably raise their rents and double the rents or whatever. And people were afraid it was going to drive out all the little mom and pop businesses and open the door for the big international chains. And that would hurt the character, the charm, the ambience of the Gothic Quarter. Whatever happened with that? Well, now the, the city hall in Barcelona, the mayor of the city is working quite hard on that. Okay? Uh, they, they are quite conscious about the problem, mm -hmm. you see. And now they are just, just, just putting some limitations, you see. To the arrival of those big, big chains, they are trying to let's say rather than limitation, let's say that they are giving more facilities to local businesses and local people to stay, to stay and, and so they they recognize the importance of not letting just unbridled capitalism shape the character of the old town, but cushion it a little bit so the little independent shops can survive. Is that true? Exactly. You just said that in the best words. Exactly. That is actually yeah. what. That's a, that's very important, and that's an issue all over Europe. I think is to um, you know it's an intervention that would be not very American in its style because we like to just let capitalism do its thing. But when you go to the Victorian market in Munich, I don't know if you've been to Munich, but there's one of the greatest open air markets in all of Europe, and there's no chains in the market because they're just not even allowed. I mean, the governments actively protect the little one off businesses because they give the personality and the character and the heritage to the old town centers. 
street musicians take advantage of the stony acoustics. And the old town is truly old. Two bold towers date back to the Roman era. These were part of the old Roman wall that protected the city in ancient times. The big stones at the base were laid in the fourth century and tucked away in a courtyard embedded in a nondescript office building is a bit of the temple which once crowned Roman Barcelona still standing tall. Boy, that is amazing. Ancient Roman temples built around our, where modern buildings built around them to protect it. Hey, we're gonna be traveling to Toledo next, but I'm hungry, Federico. I don't know about you, but we can't be doing all of this travel without some food. I know it's four o'clock in the morning for you, but the Spaniards eat late, right? Yeah, so we do. tell us a little bit about what I'm going to be eating here, all right? I've got my beautiful plate, and I'm just going to pick these things up, and you're going to tell us about it, because when you go to a tapas bar, you buy a lot of little plates like what I've got. These would be not individual tapas. These would be kind of like rations, a little bit bigger plate that a group of friends could share. And this is patatas bravas. What is that? Patatas bravas, brave potato cubes. They are slightly fried with a little bit of salt and pepper and with a magic touch of pimenton. Oh, pimenton. That's what I just shook in here, all of the uh, um, paprika. So we got salt and oil and paprika. And then bravas, does that mean brave? Brave, yeah. <laughs> because it's, is it because it's spicy? Because it is slightly spicy, yeah. I ah, look at that. So this is like spicy ketchup. It's just, leave it to the Spaniards, not to just have boring ketchup, but to have <laughs> spicy ketchup, brava sauce. Mm -hmm. mm. So if it's like, you don't see French fries very much, you see patatas bravas. So that'd be your potato sidekick. Now, this is something that you taught me about in Madrid, in the wonderful pubs in Madrid. And I just cooked this up. I had a whole bowl of these beautiful um, peppers. Aren't yes. these beautiful? Look at that. Wow. <laughs> and, um, and then I fried it up in a little bit of what they called fancy uh, salt and a little what they call a whisper, <laughs> a whisper of, of a lemon. This is from a local restaurant here in Seattle called Ocho Seattle. It's a great little Spanish restaurant. And what we do on Monday Night Travel is we just take a moment to remind all of our travelers we need to consume, assuming and understanding that we shape our future by how we spend our money. If you, if you care about making big chain restaurants stronger than ever, spend your money there. If you care about keeping the little mom and pops in business, man, go to the local restaurants and patronize them all over the United States. But this is Pimento Pedrone. And why am I nervous every time I bite one into these, huh? You have to be nervous, you see, because those pimientos de padrón. Mm. Unos, otros no. Padrón peppers. Some of them are hot, some of them are not. So you never, <laughs> never. I mean, they're all delicious, but occasionally, occasionally, just by, <laughs> you only feel it when you, it is actually inside your mouth. There is one that is really hell. It's really, yeah. really hot. It's really hell. Hot. It's that hot. Just a Russian roulette. So you brave. got your patatas bravas, you got to be bravas, brave to eat it. And then you got your Russian roulette here with your uh, pimientos. You. <laughs> oh, you Spaniards live dangerously. It, it, it adds an edge to the whole food experience, doesn't it? <laughs> now, Spaniards also have an interesting way of fixing up their toast in the morning at breakfast. Ah. And you got your toast, and then you got your beautiful tomato, and you squish the tomato onto the toast you just grate it on there and then yeah. you put some fancy salt and some nice oil and what do you have federico sometimes uh, well over that is like sometimes a little bit of a uh, jamón ibérico iberian ham oh sometimes. yeah or how about maybe a little bit of chorizo chorizo yes the spanish chorizo that is not as spicy by the way and i can see those anchovies anchovies Ooh. So this is all my different kinds of uh, tomato pan, tomato toast, and I'm going to be digging into that. And oh, I got my mm, my gazpacho, my cold vegetable soup. 
your gazpacho, which is better than the one that I had, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I sprinkled my uh, croutons and my little crunchy bits of ham. And in the summertime, especially, this is really a beautiful thing. It really is. It's actually coming from southern Spain, Andalusia. You have their gazpacho and salmorejo, both. Mm. Both. Yes. Salmorejo. Yeah. That's J O, right? I'm really getting fancy with my Spanish. Um, that's two words you need to know on the menu because it's a nice go to refreshing, healthy uh, uh, soup. Super refreshing, super healthy. Gazpacho is basically a soup, and salmorejo is a, is a cream, a tomato cream that is also mm. delicious. A uniquely wonderful thing about traveling in Spain is going to the bars and eating this kind of food. I've done it with you. Anybody can do it. It's nice to have a guide, but you can do it on your own. And you need to know the words. And then it's easy. It's nice to go a little early before the crush of the local people. So you can find a place at the bar and people can hear your broken Spanish. But if you know a few words, you can put, you can cobble together a pretty good dinner, can't you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, in Spain, I mean, we, we just use uh, tapas, uh, just as an, an excuse to socialize, to meet friends. Basically. And you know, Federico, I'm so tired of hearing Americans say, oh, they eat dinner so late in Spain. Well, stop complaining and go to a tapas bar. You can have tapas all day long. <laughs> it's dinner. It's fast. It's cheap. It's characteristic. You'll never forget it. And why not? But don't try to find a restaurant at seven o'clock in the evening, because that's when the staff is eating. If anything, they don't want to see you until nine o'clock. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but if you want a good meal, go to the bar. It's not a like a tavern in America. It's a bar. It's the community place where you go. You have your tapas and you get your selection of drinks. And I'm I decided to not go wine tonight, but I'm going cider. Very good choice from northern Spain. We have really good cider, which is refreshing and cheap and, and wonderful. Go to any of those cidrerias, cider houses, where you get. A refreshing glass of cider. The way they do it, just do it, Rick. You know how to do it, yeah. <laughs> I do it like this, but I don't do it with the bottle because I'd have a mess all over my desk here. But <clears throat> they they pour it like over a meter. A meter? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, they why, must... why do they do that? Because then you get you get actually. We say that the the, the cider gets more and more power somehow. It's more refreshing and those bubbles. We just enjoy to drink those bubbles. It, it aerates it. it. It carbonates it. It's like, I always like to say, travel carbonates your life. Well, pouring your cider like this carbonates your apple juice. What are you drinking, Federico? Actually, this good Rioja wine from the Rioja Valley, of course. Rioja Crianza. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We it's actually one of the best, one of the best red wines in in Spain. Wines in Spain are actually very good and not necessarily expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, the wines in Spain used to be table wine. I think they produced the most wine, and it was just run of the mill. You, 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 it was okay, but it was never going to win an award. Now you got to give Spanish wine another look. Rioja is a good word. Yeah. Um, Tempranillo, that's a good word. Yep. And yep. when you go to a bar, you're going to spend a dollar for a glass of wine. That's if you just ask for a glass of red wine, vino tinto, you're going to get the run of the mill table wine. Why not splurge? Take out a loan from the bank and spend two dollars instead of one, and you'll get Crianza. You get exactly. I mean, it's just, just a matter of common sense. Good taste. No, I, I just said a word that is very important in your vocabulary. Show me on the label of that wine. Ah, oh, yeah. What from Rioja? Crianza. Ah, Crianza, yeah. Crianza. There we find Crianza. That means that these, these bottle of wine I mean, has been in the, this, the wine has been for several months in an oak barrel. You see, okay. Think, so it'll cost a little more, but it'll still be cheap and it'll be top quality. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Hey, now we're going to go to the historic. Good. spiritual and artistic capital of Spain. And I'm not talking Bilbao. No, not yet. I'm not talking Cordoba. Okay. I'm not talking Zaragoza. I'm not talking Burgos. I'm not talking Valencia. What am I talking? Okay, well, the holy, holy, holy Toledo. Holy Toledo. Let's carry on. All right. Thanks, Federico, for being our guide. 
oh, I forgot, we're not going to Toledo yet, we're going to a party. Oh my goodness. Hey, this is, I gotta just set this up because this is so cool. Um, we have, right where I'm sitting in my living room here, two years ago, less than two years ago, you were here, a hundred Rick Steves tour guides were here. We were having our annual tour guide alumni, our, our annual summit, our guides get together, all of our travelers that took our tours. It's a week long series of workshops and, and, uh, and learning sessions and comparing notes and working on our itineraries. And every night we have a party and I love to invite everybody over. And for the last 20 years, we've had a tradition called our guides talent show. And we have 100 guides from 10 or 12 different countries, and each group of guides will share a little bit of their culture. And a couple of years ago, you were here, the featured guide from the Spanish group, and you were singing Besame Mucho, and you inspired your workmates, your other Spanish guides, to just stand up and join in. We're going to see that right now. And we're going to celebrate it with 100 other Rick Steves tour guides all packed into this room. But before we do, Tell us in English what the famous Besame Mucho song is meaning so we can better understand your Spanish singing. It's a very beautiful romantic song. It says, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me a lot. Please just kiss me as many times as you want, as many times as you can, because I really have the feeling that one of these evenings I'm going to miss you. I'm going to lose you forever and ever. And I just want to be next to you forever and ever. Please kiss me. <laughs> okay. Okay, Federico, stop, stop. That's enough. That's enough. Let me take another sip of this. And now we're going to listen to Federico sing Besa Mi Mucho right here in my living room with all of our guides celebrating with you. Okay, amigas, amigos. Kisses and kisses and more kisses from Spain. Besame. Besame. Federico, that was a magic moment. It, it'll live forever in infamy right here. And I'm so glad that our guides are better guides than they are singers. I'll just say that. But you got a great voice. But man, that was fun. Thanks for sharing that. Now we're going to go to Toledo. <laughs> Toledo is so well-preserved and packed with cultural wonder, the entire city has been declared a national monument. You'll see no modern buildings. It's an ideal place to savor the delights of Spain, cultural, historic, and tasty. Spain's historic capital has 2,000 years of tangled history crowded onto a high rocky perch. It's protected on three sides by a natural moat, the Tagus River, and everywhere else by formidable man-made fortifications. Toledo was, for centuries, an important Roman transportation hub with a thriving Jewish population. When Rome fell, it was ruled first by the Visigoths and then by the Moors. Centuries later, when the Christians conquered the city, they made it Spain's political and religious capital. 
In the 1500s, when the city reached its natural limits as defined by its river, the king packed up and moved his capital to more spacious Madrid. Toledo became a political backwater, only to be rediscovered by romantic 19th century travelers. Today, while small in population and of minor importance politically, Toledo remains a vital center of culture, art, and religion. It survives much as it was when Europe's most powerful king called it home. So Federico, that to me is a fascinating thing. And I always like to call Toledo the artistic, historic, and spiritual capital of Spain. But of course, it was built in the hairpin turn of the Tagus River because that provided a moat on three sides with cliffs to protect the city. And they just had to build one small wall. So in modern times, they needed a bigger modern capital. So they moved the government an hour north to Madrid. But today, Toledo seems like a small town, but it really is um, true to call it the yeah. historic, artistic, and spiritual capital of Spain, isn't it? Totally. Toledo is still preserving all that. And that, is, and that is what you feel when you go there. You see how Toledo was, five years ago, one of the most cosmopolitan cities ever known, where Muslims and Jews and Christians, they all coexisted in a quite reasonable harmony before the arrival of Isabella and Ferdinand, the Catholic monarchy. And then there was, a, 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 obviously they knew what they were in that geographical enclave, which is really, really unique. And then after that, of course, Madrid became the capital, but that is another chapter, another story. Toledo is unique, it really is. And when you do go to Madrid, you find the modern uh, palace, which rivals Versailles and the Schönbrunn Palace. Uh, Vienna, Paris, and Madrid would be the three big capitals in Europe. So you got the, the Royal Palace, and you've got the Prado Museum, which rivals the Louvre. Why is there so much great art in Madrid? Why is there so much great art in Vienna? Why is there so much great art in Paris? Because that's where the big kings were. And if you're a big king, you get to collect all that art. And then you're long gone after the revolution, but you still got all that art. Today, you've got beautiful art right there at the Spanish capital from the Spanish Empire. Toledo's handy escalator gives those approaching the city from the bus station or car park a sweat-free lift into town, particularly welcome in the hot summer. Lassoed into a tight maze of lanes, Toledo has a confusing medieval street plan. But major sites are well signposted. By the way, Federico, I'm eating my dangerous uh, Russian roulette uh, peppers. Yeah. <laughs> And so far, I'm okay, but keep an eye on me. Explore. All right. And remember, some of the best attractions come without signs. For centuries, Christians, Jews, and Muslims enjoyed this city together. Toledo's history is a complex mix of these three great religions with an impressive record of peaceful coexistence. Physical reminders of Toledo's multicultural history are everywhere. In the year 711, zealous members of the world's newest religion, Islam, conquered the Iberian Peninsula. For seven centuries, these North African Muslims, called Moors, dominated Spain. The Moors were impressively tolerant of the people they ruled, allowing Christians and Jews to practice their faiths freely. With cultural ties stretching from here, across North Africa, all the way to Arabia and beyond, the more civilization here in Spain was a beacon of learning in Europe's so-called dark ages. Hey, I got to brag about how my cameraman knew <laughs> just where to tell me to stop when we were doing this on camera. Check this out. You know, when you ever find yourself on camera, listen to what your cameraman says, because he'll say stop right there, not right there, but right there, because he knows he wants to frame you nicely in the shot. And he wanted me to be framed by that beautiful horseshoe uh, arch there. Practice their faiths freely. With cultural ties stretching from here, across North Africa, all the way to Arabia and beyond, the more civilization here in Spain was a beacon of learning in Europe's so-called dark ages. Bingo, look at that. Pretty good, wow. Mathematics, astronomy, literature, and architecture all flourished. After Christians took back Toledo in 1085, many Moorish craftsmen and builders stayed on leaving their Arabic imprint on the city for generations to come. This looks like a mosque, but it's actually a Jewish synagogue. It was built in the 1200s for Jews by Moorish craftsmen. The decor, while Arabic in its style, 
comes with Jewish motifs. The shelf is a Hebrew symbol calling worshipers to listen to the word of God. While the men worshiped in the main area, women worshiped behind the screen. 200 years later, the mosque-like synagogue was retrofitted to be a Christian church. The peaceful coexistence couldn't last forever. Spanish kings united Spain into a Christian nation. They gave Jews and Muslims a choice, convert or leave. In 1492, sure, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but that was also the year that Spanish Christians exiled the Jews and successfully kicked the Moors back into Africa. A sweet remnant from its Moorish days is Toledo's famous marzipan. Shops all over town sell marzipan goodies in ready-made gift boxes, but I like to select my own. Adios. A great thing about travel is trying things you've never tried before. For years I've been looking at these fruity marzipan and I've, I've never tried one. Hmm. It's actually good, but I'm gonna stick with the purest. This is the Cinerieno. Oh yeah, top quality marzipan. Oh yeah. <laughs> Toledo, Spain's leading Catholic city, has a magnificent cathedral. Shoehorned into the old center, its exterior rises brilliantly above the medieval clutter. And the interior, so lofty and vast, is celebrated as the most Gothic of Spain's churches and the most Spanish of Gothic churches. Wander among the pillars and imagine when the light bulbs were candles and the tourists were pilgrims. And for worshipers, past and present, the windows provide spiritual as well as physical light. Federico, I, I love that line, wander among the pillars and imagine when the light bulbs were candles and the tourists were pilgrims. It's our challenge in our travels to put ourselves in an appropriate mindset when we, it doesn't matter what your faith is or what you think about the church. If you're going to a church, go in there like a pilgrim 400 years ago, and then you're surrounded by the awe-inspiring wonder of the place in its intended context. The more we know about what we're going to see and experience, the more we're going to get out of it. And those who bring a lot to their travels go home with much more. And a guide, of course, helps accentuate that. But there's really important to understand what you're looking at and then make a point to maximize the experience. For example, a long time ago, I heard that there was a Visigothic mass right here in this cathedral. The Visigoths, those were the barbarians that were there a thousand years ago after the fall of Rome. And they've got this ancient mass that to this day, they still do every Sunday morning at six o'clock or something like that. I got up early, I walked down there, I found the little chapel and all of a sudden I went in and the door closed, I couldn't get out. I was just this dorky American tourist that didn't speak the language in a Visigothic mass. There was just a handful of people there. And the Orthodox priest was thankful I was visiting. And there were so few people. I actually was handed the Bible. I had to hold this big giant Bible as he read from it. And I was trapped in there for an hour, but it was a magical experience. And I'm so thankful. I took the risk. I took the initiative and I made it happen. Those are how we do the memories. If you have a chance to go to a Visigothic mass, check it out. Do they still have that mass there in the cathedral? They do, they do. Some people say you have to be really devoted if you want to go there at, <laughs> at 6 a.m. in the morning. But you know, regardless you are a religious person or not, we have to admit that it's a very unique experience. It, it is a wonderful experience. And those experiences are available if we reach out. There are ways that we can do that, but you got to take the initiative. It's, it's really rewarding. Marvel through the Iron Gate at one of the most stunning altars in all of Spain. The complex composition shows the story of Jesus' life, from his birth in the manger to his death on the cross. While the centerpiece holds the Holy Communion bread and wine, the entire altar conveys the Christian message of salvation through Christ. Well, the cathedral is primarily a place of worship. Its sacristy and treasury have enough jewels, great paintings, and other art to put any museum on the map. Hey, Federico, I just want to take just a short break now to uh, check in with you about, well, first of all, your, your food. Are you getting enough to eat at 4 o'clock in the morning? This is your second show, by the way. Oh, come on, eat some of that. You got to eat some more. You're going to waste away. <laughs> I'm 
<laughs> ah, thank you. I'm I'm enjoying my chorizo on my uh, my uh, tomato toast, and I've yet to get into my anchovies, but that is on deck. I'm just really, and you know my pimiento de padrón. I'm a I'm this is perhaps my favorite dish in all of Spain. I know and, that. <laughs> yeah, you've you've seen me in ecstasy in a lot of those bars. I'm enjoying it right here. It's quite good, actually. Hey, um, I'm just curious. I was just in uh, Europe for a week, and um, I wanted to see how the whole COVID thing was going. And I felt like Europe is getting its act together from a vaccination point of view and from a security and safety and health point of view. Very strict. If, if you are one of these people that don't want to get a shot, your world is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And I'm all for that, frankly. Um, and uh, when I was in Paris, um, boy, they've had some challenges. You can't even go to a terrace of an outdoor restaurant without showing you've had your shot. Your American CDC card works just fine. I felt comfortable on the buses. I felt comfortable on the trains. I felt comfortable in the museums because there's this strict, strict insistence that if you're vaccinated, you're welcome. If you're not vaccinated, you can stand outside and we'll get out there when we're done having fun inside with people who have that ethic. What's going on in Spain these days when it comes to the fight against COVID? Yeah, well, actually in Spain, in Spain we have the, we all have you know, our cell phones, the, the, the app really shows, it shows to you that we are actually vaccinated. The Spain right now, I have to tell American travelers that Spain is right now the most vaccinated country in Europe. Bravo! What, what? What percent? Yeah, 80, 80 percent. 80 percent. And yeah, yeah. And that was you must, you must feel good about that. We are actually, we feel really good. Our president, he, he had that, that, that goal. He said, you know what? Just before fall arrives, we'll be vaccinated 80 percent of the Spanish population. And that is absolutely wonderful. That is necessary. That is a matter of common sense. And I, I really feel, you know, safe in my city, you see, in my country, we just with a little bit of prudency and common sense and, and, mm -hmm. and healthy everywhere. And with the, obviously, with the vaccine, yeah. we go everywhere and we just keep moving ahead. You see? So you got, I, you got your card, you got your QR code on your phone or whatever, and you got your mask and you've got your security and life is going to go on. And then slowly we'll get back to normalcy. By the way, you've been leading our tours for 15 years, and uh, you'll be in, God willing, next summer, most of our tours are sold out right now. You'll be leading tours, our eight-day tour of Barcelona and Madrid, and our 14-day tour of the Best of Spain. Very quickly, can you explain to people what is in the Best of Spain two-week Rick Steves tour that you lead? It's a wonderful tour. It takes actually a couple of weeks, no more than a couple of weeks. And the first week is all about the two big cities. Madrid and Barcelona, Barcelona and Madrid with that wonderful high-speed train between the Ave. And uh, that takes roughly, I mean, three days and a half in each city. And then we go, we go, we go, we go to uh, Toledo, Holy Toledo, that wonderful excursion. That is the first week of the tour. And then after that, it's time to drive southbound and to, to be seduced by the magic of Andalusia, uh, Seville, uh, and Granada, and there's so many picturesque places in South and Spain. It's a wonderful book. It really, it really is. That sounds just great. And I love the way it's sort of two parts. It's the best of Spain in two weeks. The first week would basically be uh, the big three, Barcelona, Madrid, and Toledo. And I remember it was a big question in the old days, would you fly or take the train from Madrid to Barcelona? Now it's kind of a slam dunk. You take the train. It's three or three and a half hours or something with the Ave. The other, I mean, I, we, we don't really take any more of those domestic flights. Uh, Spain right now is offering to you the most modern fleet of high-speed trains in Europe, the AVE. A-V-E. <laughs> Alta. A-V-E. E. Now I know. Alta. Alta? Española. Okay, is. so high. No, no. High speed Spain. Spain. That is high speed, exactly. And uh, and that bird, that that name, naming that word in, in, in English goes it means bird because those trains they really or nearly fly. You can be from Madrid to Barcelona. That is just two hours and a half if you drive seven or maybe eight hours driving time. And if you go to the airport, you're going to spend two hours just getting to the airport and getting there early and waiting at the gate. So just walk to the train station. 
have a picnic, read your book, enjoy the view, and bam, you're in Barcelona. Absolutely. Federico. A V E. e. <laughs> Alta Velocity España. Hey, um, I want to take this moment to thank Gabe and thank Lisa and thank uh, uh, Julianne. Our friend Ben, who's normally with us, is in Russia right now. He's doing a one-year foreign study program in Russia. I'm so excited for him. And uh, But it's just great to have our team that makes Monday night travel possible. I want to remind you that we've got Q&A coming up in just a few minutes. If you got any questions for Federico, uh, Gabe is going to collect those questions. And we'll be having our Q&A question in just a moment. Uh, if you want links to Federico, because Federico does his own tours, when he's not doing Rick Steves tours. Uh, we've also got a link to our favorite guide in Andalusia down in Sevilla, uh, Concepcion. And we've got links to Ocho, the restaurant that helped us with our dinner tonight. And we've got a link to Semana Santa, Holy Week in Sevilla, which is really the greatest festival in all of Spain. That's all there in the chat section of Monday Night Travel. And we wanna remind you that uh, again, next week we're gonna go on Monday night, we're gonna have the Hippie Trail. It's a trip down memory lane, my trip of a lifetime, literally my trip of a lifetime. 1978, I was 23 years old, going from Istanbul to Kathmandu through Afghanistan. So we'll check that out together uh, with your attendance. Hey, Federico, let's carry on now and do more of the best of Spain. Here we go. In the 20th century, 1992 to be exact, Sevilla hosted a World's Fair that left the city with today's striking 21st century infrastructure. Dramatic bridges, a sleek new train system, and even a new airport. Today, 700,000 people, it's Spain's fourth largest city, an exuberant Andalusian capital. But the charm of Sevilla is best enjoyed in its traditions. Like flamenco, Spaniards consider Andalusia the home of flamenco. While impromptu flamenco still erupts spontaneously in old world bars, most tourists attend a show like this. The men do most of the machine gun footwork. The women concentrate on graceful turns and a smooth, dramatic step. Flamenco guitarists with their lightning fast finger roll strums are among the best in the world. The intricate rhythms are set by castanets and hand clapping. In the raspy voiced wails of the singers, you'll hear echoes of the Muslim call to prayer, an evocative reminder of centuries of Moorish rule. Ole! <laughs> Federico! I got to say, when you're in Spain, the big acts are in Madrid, but all the lively, accessible, and touristy acts are down in Sevilla. And I, I don't want to apologize for the tourist shows. That's a tourist show. It's filled with tourists. It's possible because of tourists. It's at a reasonable hour. It's one hour long. You get to see all the main motions. I think it's quality. It's 20 bucks. You get a drink. And it's easy. You could stay up late and spend a lot of money and do something fancy. But for me, Sevilla is the place. And you've got lots of different bars that respect their tradition and offer a beautiful, beautiful flamenco experience. Um, what's your advice, Federico, for appreciating flamenco when we're in Spain? Flamenco is um, flamenco. I've been guiding people for so many years to many different destinations. And I, I like so many of those folk shows. I have to say the flamenco is, is really seducing. I mean, it's, just, it's an ex explosion of energy. Uh, the, 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 the melodies that came actually from, from India many centuries ago, the rhythms that came from Africa, both together, they just came into Spain. And now we have flamenco. I mean, I don't even know anyone who doesn't like flamenco. I mean, it's, just, it's just an explosion of energy and happiness. And it's riveting. It's riveting. You just get, they drill their eye, their eye contact into you and you just feel like it's you and the performer alone up in the sky. Uh, it's a beautiful experience. The town square is Plaza Nueva. It honors King Ferdinand III, 
fondly remembered for freeing Sevilla from the Moors in the 13th century. From here, wander into Sevilla's pedestrian zone shopping center, which Spaniards prefer to the suburban mall. This is the place for traditional Spanish fashions. But I wouldn't know my manchego from my mantilla without a little local help. My friend and local tour guide, Concepcion Delgado, has agreed to be my personal shopper. So there's all these traditional things to buy. Isn't it just for tourists that they sell these? No way. These are for locals. We love our things. We have preserved our traditions for centuries. So these traditions are healthy? Completely. This is one of my favorite shops. Buenos dias. Hola. traditional accessories that women wear in Spain. Shawls, mantillas, and fans. Starting with the shawls that you can see here, big display of beautiful colors and uh, embroideries, which are very uh, practical for us too. We would use them as accessories, but they also have a function, which is warming you when you're cold. This is what we wear on top of the beautiful, nice flamenco dresses to attend to the April Feria. On top of the flamenco dress, you cannot wear a simple coat. You have to wear something more distinguished, which is a shawl. You can leave it like that. It's more sexy. Hmm? Here we've got the mantilla. The mantilla is another accessory which can be in two colors, white or black. It's always combined with this comb, which is incorporated in the mantilla like this, and then we wear that on our heads. Okay. The white one, it's only for the feria, for the festival in April, when women wear them to attend the bullfights. Let's have a look at the fans now. As you can see, very different colors, different materials, but they are mostly made in wood. Remember that Sevilla gets very hot during the summer and uh, women, all ladies, use them especially when they attend services. Very old churches don't know air condition and they are cooling themselves like this. Sometimes you hardly hear the priest just... That's all around you. In the old days there was a language with fans which is disappearing but in the love game it was very useful too. For example, you were looking at someone that you weren't interested at you can go away because I don't like you much. But if you were really interested, that movement could tell him something, don't you think? Anyway, the most uh, common movement for fun is... I really like Concepcion. Federico, do you work with her very much? Very much. She's absolutely wonderful, not only as a guide, as a person, she is really adorable. She's so beautiful with her passion for teaching and her knowledge of the culture. Uh, I, I don't. I honestly don't know. Do we hire her with our groups that are in Sevilla to do the day trip? She's actually our local expert in Seville. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, you could do it perfectly well, but it is nice to hire a local guide like Concepcion. So on a Rick Steves tour, we have our guide who would be like Federico with you for two weeks. But yep. in different cities, we still, even though we have a guide, a first class guide, we like to have a local voice. You get to know more people. And Concepcion is just beloved among our, our guide staff and with our tour members. Some of Spain's best bullfighting is done right here in Sevilla's 14,000 seat Plaza de Toros. There are fights on most Sundays, Easter through October. Bullfighting is just one facet of the pageantry-packed traditional culture so alive in Andalusia. With or without the bulls, festivals fill the arena with vibrant traditions, music, colorful dress. And now we know about the mantillas. There they are, the big combs that keep those beautiful lace shawls uh, elevated. And a proud heritage. Well, bullfighting is controversial and many believe that the patronage of tourists just helps keep a brutal spectacle alive. Others see bullfighting as a real and vivid part of Spanish culture. Whether or not you actually attend a bullfight is up to you. To learn about this tradition without actually supporting it, you can tour Sevilla's Plaza de Toros and check out its bullfighting museum. Your visit starts with a tour through the strangely quiet and empty arena. In the museum, 
you'll learn more. A few special bowls are honored here, each awarded the bovine equivalent of an Oscar for putting up the best fight of the year. This one's missing an ear. It was awarded to the matador, who also performed well. Matadors dressed to kill, elegant in their tight-fitting and richly ornamented suits of light. These matadors dress so elegantly, don't they? Mm, they I would say... Very in a popular very, with women. Very much. They look very sexy. Besides, uh, most of them are rich yeah. and very handsome, too. Of course, they are a state... Well, wow, rich, handsome, matador. It's interesting how they are really the heartthrob. Are they still the heartthrob, Federico? Yeah. <laughs> Look at that guy. He's just got, he's just got all that confidence, all that swagger. He's dressed to kill. What do they call it? A suit of lights? Yeah, exactly. Traje de luces. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In Spain, as movie stars can so be. So some girls dream about getting a matador. I think many. One of my best friends, of course, she wanted to marry one of them, but unfortunately, he married someone else not too pretty. <laughs> the first aid room is where injured fighters are rushed. Hoping not to end up there, matadors pray here, in the chapel. The Virgin of Macarena is a protector of matadors and the favorite among Sevillanos. While her images are everywhere, you can see the actual Darling of Sevilla nearby at the Basilica de la Macarena. Grab a pew and study the Weeping Virgin. She's a 17th century doll, complete with articulated arms and human hair. She's even dressed with underclothes. With crystal teardrops, her beautiful expression, halfway between ecstasy and sorrow, touches pilgrims. Uh. Federico, I'm, I gotta say, I'm, I'm kind of a sucker for the Virgin of Macarena. I love her. <laughs> Sevillanos Se yeah. are crazy about that particular virgin. Yeah, they are, they are actually. Many of those people are quite devoted people yeah. to Madonna or Macarena, right? And that is, it's also, I mean, the, the, the devotion to the Virgin, the festival of Macarena, uh, it is also a quite interesting thing to see, regardless you are a religious person or not. It's actually yeah. But I, I think they feel that she feels your sorrow. She, the, she empathizes with you. She's been okay. there, you know. And uh, what, once a year they take her out and parade her through the streets on Easter time. And it's just, I've been there for that. It's really quite, quite an experience. And yeah. uh, she's from, uh, yeah. So you'll see her parked in her stall there at the church unless you're there on Easter when you go to Sevilla. Hey, Federico, that was just a great trip through Spain. We could do a lot more, but right now we're ready for Q&A. And uh, Gabe, do we have any questions? Rick, we have a lot of wonderful questions for you and Federico tonight. But before we get to those, can we have a quick word from our sponsor? Well, thank you, Gabe. I'd love to share a word from our sponsor. Rick Steves Europe is a band of 100 hardworking travel lovers. You, me, 98 others. Plus, we've got about 100 guides, most of them living in Europe, like Federico, who are eager to be getting back into the bus and taking people around. Uh, but we're just waiting for all of us to get a grip on this pandemic. And we are hopeful. We are, we are confident that the spring of 2022, we will be touring again. Again, I was just in, I'm still jet laggy right now um, from a trip to Paris and France and hiking around Mont Blanc through a little bit of Italy, a little bit of Switzerland and a little bit of France. It was a great experience and I'm feeling confident. Um, for 2022, we've almost sold out our tours. I think we have 28,000 uh, seats sold and about 2,000 seats open, but that's still a lot of seats. If anybody is curious about our tours, go to ricksteves.com and you'll find a uh, 40 different itineraries, each led by a guide like Federico. And uh, we hope that you can join us on one of our tours. Rather than talking more about our tour program, what I'd like to talk about right now is next Monday night travel. I'm going to have a trip down memory lane. I'm going to be joined by Gene Openshaw, my original travel partner, my, my good buddy who's a co-author in so many of our books. And we're going to do that hippie trail trip, 1978, from Istanbul to Kathmandu. And, uh, you know, it's been an emotional and difficult time for anybody who's, who's got any affinity for Afghanistan. And uh, I traveled to Afghanistan and loved every minute of it. 
And uh, it's so tragic what's going on now. And we did a series of posts on our Facebook page last uh, couple of weeks ago. And it was their, our most watched and clicked uh, series ever on Facebook. If you're curious about that, check it out. It's right from our journal. But next week, it's not going to be a bunch of video clips. It's going to be a slideshow, an old fashioned slideshow. There's Jean and me, and we're going to be going um, all the way across uh, Asia on a, not a bus like this, but this was an option. There's plenty of seats up in the rooftop there. Uh, but uh, we had beautiful hotels. Look at that hotel, Federico. Does that remind you of the hotels on our tours? I hope not. That was the old hotel in, uh, along the, the hippie route there across Asia. But man, I had a great time. Amazing scenes. Oh my goodness. Amazing vistas. Thrilling to finally get to India after all of that. Uh, and then the time in Afghanistan was just mind blowing. This is the aut autonomous region of Khyber Pass. And you could understand why anybody who tries to uh, invade and take over Afghanistan is going to get you have a hard time doing it. That's for sure. But my moments in Afghanistan connecting, sitting on a bus next to this girl and her mother all day long. I mean, that was what was that 40 years ago? This girl's 50 years old now. Imagine the life she's lived. So many interesting, beautiful souls in Afghanistan and so many opportunities for the traveler to connect. Uh, that's what we're going to be talking about next week. And most of these shots are from Afghanistan, the people of Afghanistan. Wow. I'm just filled with emotion when I think back on that trip and how the world is such, such a wonderland to explore. Uh, so if you want to join us uh, next week, that's going to be... Um, uh, a week from tonight, we're going to do the hippie trail around Afghanistan. And then after that, the week after that, we're doing little Europe, all the little countries. You can take, if you take Luxembourg, you can fill it with a bunch of little countries. It looks like a big pizza. Luxembourg would be the whole pizza. And then you got uh, Liechtenstein, you got Andorra, you got San Marino, you got Monte Carlo, and you got the Vatican City right there next to your peppers and your and your uh, olives. Uh, we're going to do the little countries of Europe two weeks from tonight. Okay, let's have some questions for Federico, Gabe. All right. So, um, Rick, you mentioned our tour, and I know Federico talked about some of our itineraries in Spain. Um, one thing that we do is in the survey at the end of each tour, tour members are asked to share their wow moment. And Federico, I would love to know, um, from the itineraries that you lead from us, what is one of your wow moments um, on the tours that you lead? Well, I, there are many, many places, many sites, but I, I, I really think that one of the wow moments in the tour is the, the Royal Palace in Madrid. The Royal Palace is very, very unique. It's not one of those palaces. There is something special about it. When I explain to our travelers, that art is a consequence of history. We find there a remarkable man, whose name is uh, Charles III, Carlos III. He was an extraordinary ethical human being with good values. And we are so lucky to say that such a wonderful man had a great longevity. He was in power for 30 years, doing wonderful things for, for Spaniards without attacking any other country in the world. Think about that, he was the most ethical ruler we ever had. And that palace is a consequence of that. That mm -hmm. palace, we were pioneers in contemporary art in those late 1700s, and that was all thanks to Charles III. And then when you transmit those stories to people, and when you see the palace, we're like, wow. Ah, Federico, you just love the art and the way it ties in with the culture. I know on our tours, you're much appreciated for that. And I also know you're famous for some, uh, some t-shirts that you wear. Can you yeah. please just, uh, do you have those t-shirts handy? Because those are just so fun. It's just, uh, well, sometimes when I go to, the, to those art galleries, I enjoy to, 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 to perform, you <laughs> see. <laughs> and to tell you in first person that I am Domenicos Totopopoulos, El Greco. He <sighs> came from Greece with his enigmatic and emblematic hand. This is actually Mr. Spock, Star Trek. This is another story. That's Star Trek, and this <laughs> is El Greco. Show me again. I El. love that. No, no, I don't want to see Spock. I want to see El Greco. Okay. This is El Greco's secret signature, by the way. See, El. Nice. At the Prado Art Gallery. What about 
uh, Diego Velázquez, who was honored with the Holy Cross of Saint James, Santiago. You see, he was a knight of Santiago, Saint James. What about the creepy, creepy, creepy Goya <laughs> with all Go those painters, those black paintings in Goya? Look at what that. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, a man who seems to be ch childish. No, he's not childish. He's childlike. And he's middle, middle yeah. of the art museum. What about that eccentric man with a kind of a peculiar behavior? Salvador Dali. Salvador. Look at that. Oh, and, of course, why not Guernica and Pablo Picasso? You see? Oh. The Cubist master. That's, yeah, I, it's actually quite enjoyable. <laughs> yes. That's a great collection. <laughs> God, that is so cool. All right, Federico, um, we have another question from Sandy. Um, and Sandy is wondering if you have any recommendations for people that want to learn the Spanish language, um, especially any immersion opportunities. And after that, I would love to hear from Rick, his advice on people that just want to learn a little bit um, to function as a traveler. Um, but first, Federico, what are some good opportunities for immersion language learning? Yeah, actually, many, many choices. It's just, uh, uh, in my opinion, if you really want to learn good Spanish language, the people say that we have to go uh, to central Spain, Salamanca. Salamanca is actually the place that we were visiting, visiting in this tour. Salamanca is the place. It's actually a wonderful town. It is uh, quite inexpensive. And that is the place where you really learn the authentic, the roots of, of the Spanish language, which is Castilian, the land of castles. That is the meaning of Castilian language. The poor language was born in the land of castles. I would say uh, Salamanca, I would say Alcalá de Henares, also, which is located in the outskirts of Madrid. You see, And there are many, by the way, many, many foreigners, especially coming from USA and Canada, who come here to learn and improve the Spanish language. And that, and that, is, that is actually a very, a very good idea, I think. In, especially now in the United States, come on, your country is already a bilingual country in many, many cities and many states that I know. Thank you. And yeah, Rick, what are your recommendations for people who maybe aren't going to become fluent in Spanish, mm. but how can they still um, exercise some of the language? Well, I would say it's dangerous to um, not know the language. When I was, uh, I, I've been traveling to Spain for more than 40 years and um, I remember when I was a kid, I would go to the bars and I wanted something nutritious and I'd actually order hot milk. And I would go to the bars and I would always say, leche caliente, por favor. And people were laughing at me and, and then I'd say, leche caliente. And then somebody says, in Spain, that's, sper that's, uh, that's slang for sperm. Uh, <laughs> 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 so I just thought, it's dangerous not to speak the language because you're going to go into a bar and order sperm, you know. But um, so I, I just, um, I don't know. I, I, try to, <laughs> I try to speak very simple English. I enunciate every letter because rather than me trying to, like, like Federico Velasquez, how do you pronounce him? Yes, exactly. If I say that with my Castilian accent, I say Velasquez. 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 And Velasquez. I could Kind of, uh, there are other places in Spain and Latin America where you say Velasquez, which is absolutely yeah. fine. But we never pronounce the U. We don't say Velasquez. We don't say that. No. Yeah. So it's complicated, and it's 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 not as dangerous as ordering hot milk, but it 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 really can be frustrating. Um, so I would just say, yeah, it's respectful to learn a little bit of the language and the polite words and so on. When you're going to a bar and you want to order your tapas, if you know a few words, if you're trying to get a good glass of wine, a few words goes a long way. But remember, educated people, people in tourism, young people, very likely to speak much more English than you speak Spanish. And I, I'm not promoting not speaking Spanish. I'm just promoting practicality. Speak yeah. simple English. If your car is broken, use internationally word, understood words. Point to the vehicle and say, auto kaput. Neither of those are Spanish words, but you would understand auto kaput. Uh, you know, just internationally understood words, no slang, no contractions, enunciate every letter, you'll do fine. All right. Uh, we have another question from Stephen who is wondering, um, what is maybe the largest misconception that people in the United States have of Spaniards? Oh. Hmm. What would you say, Rick? 
Well, I would say there is the confusion of Mexico and Spain with the language. More Americans know Mexican Spanish than Spanish Spanish. And it was a big adjustment for my father. He thought he spoke Spanish, but he spoke very Mexican Spanish. And a lot of Americans, you know, a tortilla is a different thing in Spain. I mean, there's, it's totally different in a lot of ways. So be careful about that. What are you laughing about? No, 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 it's true, it's true. Actually, when they come here and they are, they see the word tortilla. Yeah. Here, tortilla is basically a frittata, Spanish frittata. It's yeah. just eggs and potatoes and maybe a little bit of uh, uh, onion and that's it. And then in Mexico, obviously, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we have another question from, um, let's see here, from Melissa, wondering if either of you have hiked portions or all of the Camino de Santiago, and if you were just recommending a small portion to somebody who's planning to travel there, what portion would you recommend? Yeah. It's a one, it's, I think it's a one month walk from the Pyrenees all the way to Santiago de Compostela. Uh, historically, pilgrims have gone from Paris to Santiago de Compostela, which is the big city in the northwest corner of Spain. Uh, classically, tourists or pilgrims will go from the Pyrenees, San, San, what is it, Pierre de Pierre de Pied, what is that city? Jean-Pierre de Pont. Jean-Pierre de Pierre de Pont, which is actually St. John next to the... So you walk from there to Pamplona and then across the arid north of Spain all the way to Santiago. I would say a lot of people do it in segments year after year. I've never met anybody who did it that wasn't very thankful they did it. It's always been an enriching experience, whether you're religious or not. And um, I would say if you do the last few days, you will have the thrill of coming into Santiago de Compostela which is the culmination historically of the pilgrimage for centuries for people that have walked from all across Europe to get there. I've been to Santiago several times and I just like to be on the square when the pilgrims are coming in. It's just filled with joy. People are overwhelmed with jubilation as they finally finish their pilgrimage and they stand on the scallop shell that's embedded in the pavement in front of the cathedral and they look up at that moss covered cathedral in the, in the rainy, uh, like the Pacific Northwest corner of Spain where everything is just foggy and mystical and they just weep with joy and then they go into that church and they have this ritual and they've got this, this big big incense thing that's as big as a London phone box swinging on a chain, like a, going all the way across this thing. And it's just mind blowing. And then they've done it. They go to the office and they get their final stamp on their, what do they call the passport for the pilgrims? The, it's just a passport. Yeah. The passport for the pilgrims. And they've done their, their, their pilgrimage. Uh, be there on the square as people are coming in or get a, there's books about it, you know, and do the last segment, but uh, it's a big walk. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, you know, your body falls apart if you're not in shape, it's tough. No, it is, it is magic, it really is. I, I enjoy very much the, the, the way of, of Navarra. You see that landscape is really beautiful in, the, in yeah. that, that territory called Navarra, not far from the Basque country. And I also have to say that at the end, when you are actually reaching, you see the, the, the town of Santiago, it's, it's, it's magic. Really yeah, that. yeah. to be there as people are walking through. Because the last overnight is about a five mile walk or something from the town. So it's a two hours to get from the last refuge into the city. So people come in late in the morning and it's a beautiful thing. It's predictable and it's, it's a, a real joy. All right. Um, we have another question from Christina who is noting that um, oftentimes, Barcelona is one of the examples that people give of over tourism. Um, and wondering, do you think that the city is, as we come back from the pandemic and traveling resumes, is there any hope of um, new measures to prevent over tourism? It's difficult. Actually, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. You see, there is a hope out there, but it's a challenge because. Well, we know that the local authorities, you see the mayor of Barcelona, and, and they are actually seriously thinking about that, how to find that point in the middle, that solution between, you know, those wonderful incomes, you see, in the city, thanks to travelers who are coming from all over, and at the same time, how to respect, you see, local people and, 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 
And uh, well, we'll see what happens. I, 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 next year is supposedly is going to be a good year, you see. And there is a hope because those local authorities are seriously thinking about how to find a solution. A few years ago, they didn't even care about this. And right now they are thinking about that and they're trying to to actually to, to make a kind of a better uh, place, a better city for everybody, for travelers and, and, and locals. You know, a problem is some people, it's their income and they want more tourism, as much tourism as possible because they own a hotel or they run a shop. Other people, they're not directly involved in tourism and they feel like their city is being invaded and changed and taken over by all of these people that don't speak their language, that don't respect their culture and so on. So there's a sort of a, a tug of war between different interests. And it's not just Barcelona. It's Paris, it's Rome, it's Venice, it's Salzburg, it's uh, Amsterdam, and Barcelona is one of the worst. Um, I would just remind people, you don't need to contribute to that by going only to the places that are so touristy. There's many other places that are beautiful and rewarding and without the tourist crowds. And you can go off season, bundle up and go off season. It makes a lot of sense. All right. Um, one final question. Um, Federico, we want to thank you for joining us. So many people in the chat were saying that they've had you on a tour, that you've been the highlight of their tour. Um, and many people were saying how much they loved you were singing. And I was just wondering, um, where did you learn to sing like that? Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. I, I simply enjoyed music very, very much since I was a child. You see, I, I had a, a good ear. And then after that, I discovered that I had a good voice. And everything has been quite spontaneous. You see, I've been just listening and singing on my own. And, I, and, and not, nothing more than that. I mostly, mostly listen to classical music, but, but any kind of music is welcome, of course. And it's just something, it's my hobby. Let's say that guiding is my, 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 my profession and, and, and singing somehow is my, my kind of frustrated vocation, you see, <laughs> probably. And that's what I do. I just sing for people. I, I share that because I, I love it. And I, 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 I just love it. Like Federico, you, Federico, you mix it together with, with joy and love. And uh, it just, I've seen you so many occasions where you just bust out into song. <laughs> and it's just, it makes everybody happy and warm. So it's a real blessing. It's a gift that you have. And I'm glad that you're um, comfortable just sharing it. It's just, life is good. And if you got a voice, use it. <laughs> if you don't have a voice, well, use it, but use it privately. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Federico, thank you so much for joining us. It's just been great to have you. Thank you, my friends. Thank you very much to all of you, Rick, and all your team. You are wonderful people. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you yes. very much. All Rick. right. And Gabe, thank you for moderating. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. And I think we'll finish it off with about a minute of bloopers, bloopers from España. Happy travels. We'll see you next Monday on the Hippie Trail. From Istanbul to Kathmandu. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of your Buenos Aires. This time we're getting all pumped up to run with the bulls in Pamplona. <laughs> <laughs> Spain was a predominantly Muslim society living under Muslim rule. In fact, some of the great thinking of ancient Greece had been forgotten by Europe, but was absorbed into Islam and given back to Europe actually by great scholars here in Spain. <laughs> Happy history. <laughs>